you know, in all your travels, Wade, around the world and these indigenous cultures, and what, what are the lessons that you've sort of found are the most salient for us today? Because, you know, I, I read Sapiens, and it was sort of a, a bit of a wake up for me. And I, I don't know what you think of this, but in that book, he kind of talked about how humans throughout history actually have been pretty destructive, that, that, that we have this sort of idealized view of ancient cultures, but maybe it's not so much like that. They, you know, like in Australia, when humans first showed up, they basically destroyed all the large mammals they <laughs> had all well, that sort of destructive thing. And they, you know, it's, it's the fascinating thing about culture is that we all face the same adaptive imperatives. We all have to, um, give birth to children, find ways to couple that are consistent, uh, deal with the agony of growing old and the inexorable separation of death and the mystery that death implies. Mm -hmm. And given that, I just find it inherently fascinating how many how many cultural expressions have developed over, over the course of uh, human evolution. And I find in that diversity great strength, you know, and great wonder and great poetry. Um, you know, you know the, the 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 nobody indulges the myth of the ecological native or or the idea that indigenous people are somehow inherently um, benign. I mean, th yeah. this, this is this is um, th this is something that no one in anthropology would would be thinking about. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the glory is is to is to just you know pay attention i mean one of the one of the things that sparked my my work at the national geographic was you know a kind of a a, a disturbing statistic that i first started to speak about a great deal in the 1990s and that was the fact that there was a complete consensus amongst linguists that half the language of the world weren't being spoken to children yeah. and and a language of course is not just vocabulary and grammar it's, it's a kind of flash to the human spirit you know every language is the way the essence of a culture comes into the world. I, I wrote once that every language was an old growth forest of the mind or a watershed of thought. Wow. An, ecosystem an old growth of, forest of the mind. Wow, that's a beautiful way you know, of or, or ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And 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 uh, to lose half those languages is to lose, by definition, half of humanity's knowledge. Mm -hmm. And and that I found to be shocking because no, you know, no biologist would dare suggest that fifty percent of all forms of life are morbid or on the brink of extinction, yet that the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. Yeah. So the question became, what do you do about it? You know, if you, if you identify a, um, um, a, 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 an area of high species endemism, you can create a protected area, but you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze culture like some kind of zoological specimen. So yeah. when I was given the mission at the geographic to change the way the world viewed and valued culture in a decade, which was my mandate, wow. um, we thought hard about that. And we settled really on storytelling because polemics, storytelling. polemics are never persuasive. Politicians um, follow, they never lead, um, but storytellers can change the world. And so we set out into what I was calling the ethnosphere, um, uh. you know, um, the sort of social web of life around the planet to find stories that wouldn't be just further examples of ethnographers celebrating the exoticism of the other, yeah. but rather really going to this sort of fundamental um, fact, which is in fact the, in addition to the vision of the earth from space, which we spoke about a moment ago, that's going to be spoken 10,000 years from now. And that vision has already infected the world in the best sense of the word. Mm -hmm. The other great discovery of our lifetime that we spoke in 10,000 years from now has yet to take hold, but it will in the lifetime of our children. It's even more important. Nothing that has happened from science has done more to liberate ourselves from the petty hatreds and tyrannies that have haunted us since the dawn of awareness. It also came about at the end of a long journey, but not in the space, in the very fiber of our beings. In our lifetimes, science has proven the philosophers to be correct. We are all one interconnected whole as, as a species. Is that is that the, the vision the, that the, the that genetic will come? the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum? 
biologically, race is an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We're all children of Africa, including those of us who walked out of the ancient continent 65,000 years ago and embarked on this incredible journey over 40,000 years, 2,500 generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the world. Yeah. But here's the important point. If we accept what science has proven to be true, that we are all cut from the same genetic cloth, it means by definition, every culture shares the same genius, the same mental acuity, the same raw human potential. And critically, whether that genius is placed into technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement of the West, or by contrast, placed into the task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth, a priority of the Australian Aborigines, for example, mm -hmm. is just a matter of cultural adaptation and choice. There is no hierarchy in the realm of culture. The old Victorian idea that we went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London, that European society yeah. sat at the apex of the pyramid going down to the so-called primitives of the world has been absolutely debunked by modern science. It's shown to be an artifact of the 19th century, no more relevant to our lives today than the notion that clergymen had then that the earth was just 6,000 years old. And this stunning affirmation of the human spirit we have seen to be what we are. And what this means is that um, the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts to be modern. They're not failed attempts to be you. No. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices, the yeah. 7,000 voices of humanity. And what this fundamentally means is that Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. Well, that's an amazing shift in thinking if yeah. we actually embrace that. And so to encourage people to begin to think in those terms, we set out in the ethnosphere on a series of journeys where we went to societies that we could, you know, um, show that. I mean, we sailed with the Polynesian Voyaging Society, for example, using the ancient wayfinding techniques that allowed the Polynesian ancestors to settle the biggest ocean on, on the earth. I mean, oh, yeah. these are sailors who can sense distant atolls beyond the visible horizon just by watching the waves across the hull of the vessel. That's they can, incredible. They can distinguish six or seven sea swells, um, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbance in the darkness. Um, as they move through the hull of the vessel, distinguishing those caused from local weather from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean that can be followed like a terrestrial explorer would follow a, a river to the sea. And the amazing thing about that that wayfinding technology it was all based on dead reckoning. Dead reckoning means you only know where you are by remembering how you got there. Yeah. So in a civilization that lacked the written word, it meant the wayfinder on the back of the vessel, never sleeping for three and four weeks, would have to remember every sign of the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, uh, the salinity in the sea, the flotsam on the surface of the sea, the currents, not just remembering the data, but the, the order of its acquisition. Because if that stream of knowledge broke, the voyage could end in disaster. And they that's couldn't how, take notes on their iPhone. <laughs> they could not take notes on their iPhone. Or, you know, we went, I mean, you're a Buddhist. We went to make a film called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. And, you know, every film, I, I kind of came up with a, a, a one line uh, to try to distill the essence of it. I mean, Polynesia, if you, the line was, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. Or mm. in, in, in wow. Tibet, we, we made a film with Matthew Ricard, um, which we call the Buddhist science of the mind. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I remember when we, we, we interviewed and saw, met, spent time with a woman who had been a lifelong retreatant for 45 years. The sun hadn't fallen on her face until the door opened when we visited her. And um, by our terms of reference, she should have been mad, you know. She had devoted 45 years to the recitation of a single mantra. And yet the woman's face who greeted us radiated loving compassion. And Mathieu said to me, this wait, is- Wait, 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 what was she doing hiding in her 40s? She wasn't hiding. She was a Satsampa Ani. She had gone deliberately into lifelong retreat 45 years ago. Wow. And what Mathieu said to me, this is a 
proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And she was a bodhisattva and a, a lama. I mean, it's almost as almost as we've sort of focused on the outer world, and a lot of these cultures are focused on the inner world and the well, exploration of that. In the, and they've been in Buddhism, an advanced yeah. in technology of the mind as we have been in the technology of the world. Well, that's why that's why Matthew always uses the term science of the mind, because what is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is a Buddhist Dharma but 2,500 years of direct empirical observation as the nature of mind? Hmm. That night, a lama said to me something really wonderful. He said, you know, we in Tibet don't believe you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. Yeah. Powerful. So, you know, what are some of those stories that, that matter now for us to help us emerge from the sort of loss of meaning and loss of connection and loss of relationship to nature. I mean, we're all sort of so disconnected. Well, I think, you know, there's so much talk, Mark, about the psychedelic revitalization, right? Mm. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, you know, as someone who, who, you know, not only did I um, inhale, I liked it. In fact, I, 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 I always say that, um, that, you know, it's interesting when we talk about these social transformations of, la of our lifetimes, the one ingredient that's always expunged from the record is the fact that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe having taken a psychedelic. I mean, I wouldn't write the way I write. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't mm -hmm. treat women the way I treat women. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't treat gay people or people of color the way I treat mm -hmm. them or interact with them. I certainly wouldn't see the natural world as I do, and I wouldn't understand the nuances of uh, cultural relativism and the, the real gifts of anthropology as I do yeah. had I not taken psychedelics, you know. Um, and, this, and this is way before they were now like in vogue. This is, you know, oh, no, I 50 mean, I was, years ago. Yeah, 50 years ago. And... Um, you know, when I, you know, when I first went to see Schultes in 1974, I, I, I knocked on his door. He was, you know, the great Amazonian explorer, you know, mentor of Andy Weil and yeah. Tim Plowman, who were like my big brothers at the time. And um, I just knocked on his door and I said, I've saved up money in a logging camp. I want to go to South America like you did and collect plants. And at the time, people didn't even know where the Amazon was, right? Mm -hmm. And rather than ask me for my credentials, he just said, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was on my way. But before leaving, I remember he had one critical piece of advice. He First of all, he said, don't bother with leather boots because all the snakes bite at the neck. And then he said, don't at come the back. Neck. At the neck. And he said, don't come back without trying ayahuasca. So... This was back in 1974. So, of course, I tried ayahuasca, amongst other things. But my point is that I, 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 much as I, I revere the role that psychedelics have played in, in um, um, the social transformations of our lifetime, and I, I probably come down on the side of Ram Dass and uh, as opposed to Tim Leary in this, or George Harrison with Ram Dass, you know, get the message, hang up. I mean, I'm sort of in the school that, you know, I'm not sure – how much psychedelics can teach us if you, if you use them again and again and again. I'm not sure how much more there is to be learned. I, I tended to be some. They open the door, open you the can door see. You walk through, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's just a matter of personal orientation and choice. I don't have any judgment on that. But I, I, I think that some of the, um, the, the, the expectations are a little inflated. I mean, I think that psilocybin can be very useful for end of life care, not to. to eliminate the fear of death but to make it perhaps manageable or understandable or or or, yeah. or whatever i think that um, ecstasy can be terrific in couples therapy and post-traumatic stress and everything mm. but i think i think the most important of all these plants and the most important role they can play is in the most healing the most important healing journey of all which is our relationship with the natural world yeah and certainly you cannot take san pedro cactus um the cactus of the four winds a plant that's been used by human society since it sparked the first civilization of the Andes, Chavin, at 2500 before the Christian era. Um, it, it, um, you cannot take that mescaline-containing denizen of the northern Andes without having a more visceral, almost sensual connection to the natural world. Yeah. So I think, I think in that way, psychedelics continue to be very, very powerful and potent medicines. So not just for trauma, not just for healing i mean they create a template upon which anything can happen i mean this is one of the you know i mean i, I think andy Weil, you know said there's no such thing as good and bad drugs there's good and bad ways of using drugs and, mm -hmm. you know, and i think he also said you know these psychedelics just create a template upon which cultural forces and beliefs can go to work you know 
And of course, all the early pioneers um, spoke in those terms, set and setting, you know, the set you bring the experience, the setting in which you take the substance. But um, I, I'm definitely of, of, of the school that believes that these are true medicines. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've definitely had a similar experience to you. It really shaped, as a young man, my view of my relationship to myself, to the natural world, to the human culture that I lived in. And it really, you know, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And, well, I mean, I, I think it's it's sort of like, you know, I I, uh, I didn't take a course in biology till third year of university. And then I, you know, I found Schultes and I found the Amazon. And I, yeah. I often look back and, and think how lucky, lucky I was that I found that because, I mean, you know, it's kind of astonishing. You, you, you would never think that you could go through university and graduate if you didn't know the difference between a photograph and a painting. And yet we graduate students all the time who don't know the formula of photosynthesis, right? The fundamental formula of life. I mean, I don't think you should be able to run for political office if you don't know that formula. I mean, yeah. the, very, you know, the very fact that carbon dioxide and water sparked by photons of light gives us carbohydrates, our food, and oxygen, our air. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is biblical verse, if you will. It is. I mean, we, we are so intertwined and we think we're so separate. Yeah, and if all the plants I, died on the planet, we'd be dead pretty quick. <laughs> when I was at Harvard, I, I, the night that I actually figured out the Krebs cycle and photosynthesis and all the, uh, all, you know, all the pathways, I, I, I just went berserk. I was yeah. like so ecstatic. I, I actually w was rushing from student to student and kind of screaming at them in the library. Mm -hmm. Do you know how this works? And I actually got escorted out by security. <laughs> I think I'm probably <laughs> the only, mad man. <laughs> only student ever kicked out of, a, out of a library at Harvard for pure kind of intellectual ecstasy. It's amazing. You know, I think uh, it reminds me of what Einstein said. He said, I'm not interested in the spectrum of this or that element. I'm interested in the thoughts of God, the rest are details. And what you're talking about when, when you talk about photosynthesis and the Krebs cycle, how we, our mitochondria create energy from oxygen and food, there ain't one intertwined cycle. Well, you know, it's, it's so funny because like, you know, uh, Suzanne Simard is wonderful. She's at UBC. And I remember when she first presented her work on mycelia, it was at a very obscure little gathering and no one seemed in the audience to rock how significant it was but i went right up to her and i said suzanne you're going to change the world and she has around mycelia mycelia in general not not psilocybin no no just her work in in, in uh, understanding the mycelia. underground networks so, of so mycelia we're understanding networks. we're understanding how plants work in very sophisticated ways but i only say that because back in the 70s when we didn't know some of these things a book came out called the secret life of plants mm -hmm that made a big deal about plants responding to Mozart and everything. And Yeah, I mean, and, they have and, 20 different senses. They have more senses than we do. <laughs> well, at the time, Tim Plowman, who was a great musician, great poet, and certainly a great botanist, he hated that book. He just hated it. And he'd wow. say, he used to say, why would a plant give a shit about Mozart? And even if it did, why should that impress us? They can eat light. Isn't that enough? <laughs> uh -huh. They can eat light. Yeah, that's true. That's amazing. They transmute light into energy. In other words, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think biology is just so extraordinary. And it's, um, um, you know, certainly I, 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 th I think how close I came to not studying it. it mm. I find it haunting. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. A study that came out that a single, a single fast food meal with fried foods had immediate effects on your arteries, causing them to stiffen and harden and reduce blood flow. Uh, so we really need to be smart about what we're eating. 